Well, thanks everyone for joining me today. Um, it's really exciting to be able to give a presentation to launch Wharfless Cable. Um, and firstly, although this is presented by me, I really want to acknowledge that a lot of people have made some significant contributions over the year to get this system up off the ground. And um, there are some few uh, notable acknowledgements that we need to make. Um, first and foremost, I really want to acknowledge Claire Carouge. Um, she's been quite fundamental in wrangling the codes of these different systems together into what we have today. And we also have had valuable scientific contributions, um, particularly from the land service modeling community based out at UNSW. And that includes Meng Wan Mu, Martin Dekauer, Anna Okala, uh, Mark Decker, Justin Kahler, and Andy Pittman. In terms of getting um, uh, Wharf and LIS, a um, uh, huge shout out to Dave Mocker. He was um, quite instrumental in getting the first version of cable into this system along with Claire. And uh, also want to acknowledge the LIS and new Wharf teams out at, at NASA who um, have developed um, the LIS um, architecture. I'm going to preface this talk as well by saying there's going to be a fair bit of shameless self-promotion of my own research. This is a tool that I've been using on and off for the last 10 years. And it's really been quite fundamental for allowing me to do a lot of exciting research in the space of land atmosphere um, interactions. And um, including a lot of that research in this talk is really some of the best ways to kind of showcase some of the utility of this modeling system. So hopefully I can toggle slides, great. So the first place to start is, well, what is it? <laughs> There's a lot of acronyms here and I'll explain uh, to you what they all are. So WARF WRF, this stands for the Weather Research and Forecasting Model. This is a very um, prolific atmospheric uh, regional model that is used by um, various users around the world. When I started my PhD, the number of registered users was of the order of tens of thousands, and it has grown um, uh, exponentially um, as the years pass by. I do want to note that we're not using the standard version of WARP here. Um, we're using NASA's unified version of WARP. And this means that there have been some enhancements to the model code um, that um, are really quite advantageous. Then we have LIS. Uh, this is NASA's land information system. It's quite a sophisticated system, comes with a lot of different utilities. But in this context, we primarily are using this as a coupler that enables us to couple cable uh, which is the Community Atmosphere Biosphere Land Exchange Model. It is Australia's land surface model, and we use list a couple cable to war, uh, which is really quite exciting. Um, for those who are less familiar with land surface modelling science, um, what, why is cable so special? Cable is special because it's really one of the very few land surface models that actually does an adequate job of representing Australian vegetation and hydrology. It's got a carbon cycle um, enabled within it. Um, and over several years now, a lot of the land surface uh, community in Australia have been um, developing this model extensively in terms of representing um, a number of different plant processes uh, involving photosynthesis and stomatal conductance, um, soil evaporation, uh, runoff, um, groundwater. Um, the list uh, is growing all the time, which is really exciting. And this schematic, it's very hard to, I guess, um, draw for you what this system looks like because it is really a hell of a lot of code. Um, but essentially you've got the cable land surface model and then you've got new wharf. And this is the coupler that handles the exchange of all the quantities that um, new wharf requires from its land surface scheme and what cable requires in terms of atmospheric conditions um, from um, the atmospheric model. I do want to point out a really important feature of this modeling system, and that is that it has two run modes. So you can run it coupled to the atmosphere. And um, there are a number of applications where this is definitely what you want to be doing. But it also has the feature that you can just run the land surface model cable uh, offline. And in doing this, you provide some metrological forcing uh, from your favorite reanalysis product, for example. And this allows you to run the land surface model um, offline very efficiently. So it's a lot faster than in the coupled mode. Um, and there are circumstances where you really will want to be doing that. And um, for most people who 
um, we'll be running simulations with this model. Ideally, you're going to be using both of these modes, and that's because um, you ideally would run the land surface model offline first to spin up the land surface state variables so that when you initialize your coupled simulations, you are using more realistic land surface initialization. And I have an example later on that will demonstrate this for you. So I think a question that many of you might be asking yourselves is why do we need another version of war? Now, I can't see all the people who have dialed in today, um, but um, for those of you who are less familiar with war, it's really important to point out that there are a lot of flavors of war out there. So you have the standard version of WARF, um, but then people have been interested in using that tool for a number of different applications where standard WARF ain't enough. And therefore there are different enhanced versions of WARF. So you have WARF DA, this is for data assimilation. You have WARF Chem for a chemistry enabled atmosphere. You have WARF Fire if you're interested in fire modeling. WARF Hydro if you're interested in hydrological modeling. Now we've got something else um, again in terms of, of the wharf list side of things. Um, in order to help you understand why we need that, we do need to talk a little bit about how the coupling actually happens between a land surface model and an atmospheric model, and also a little bit about the history of wharf itself. Now I've just drawn a really, really simplified diagram of how that coupling actually takes place. So here we have our atmospheric model, um, and, and this is just representing a single grid cell. And then we have our land surface model, again, representing uh, another single grid cell. When these two are coupled together, the exchange that occurs between them is all in terms of what's um, uh, in the vertical space. So the land grid cell will transfer quantities to the atmospheric grid cell above it. Now, for those who are more familiar with atmospheric modeling, you will recognize that yes, there's transfer between the vertical layers of the model, but there's also lateral exchange between adjacent grid cells as well. For land surface models, um, it is changing, but generally most land surface models, their exchange is only with the atmospheric grid cell above it and not this lateral exchange between um, grid cells. That is changing though. I just wanna make that point really clear. What um, people who may be less familiar with land surface models may be aware of is that in order to capture how um, complex the land surface is and that that can have an impact on radiative exchange, um, hydrological cycling with moisture transfer to the atmosphere, um, momentum transfer, uh, as well as the exchange of other um, carbon and, and other nutrients, the land um, grid cells are often subdivided into different surface types, which is what these little um, shaded boxes are indicating here. And that's because of those different properties in the surface um, do affect the fluxes that are then passed on to the atmosphere. And in order to capture that complexity without necessarily um, increasing your computational overhead by having a very fine resolution atmospheric model, you, you can sheet in a way by having uh, this subdivision in the land surface model. And so what it does at every single time step is it runs through or iterates through the calculations for every different surface type and calculates those fluxes. And then it aggregates it to a single value for that land grid cell um, uh, in, in this instance. And then it passes that information to the atmospheric model. So, um, <clears throat> Essentially, that's sort of, um, I guess, the difference between the atmospheric modeling and the land surface modeling. Why is it important to tell you something about that? Well, historically, a lot of the land surface schemes that are available within WARF are a little bit simple in terms of their characterization of land surface processes. Obviously, as time goes by, everyone is investing a great deal of effort in developing their models. And, and this is also true for what is available within WARF. But generally, um, the advancement of the land surface schemes within WARF has been um, lagging behind the community itself. So you do have more sophisticated land surface models uh, in a lot of the Earth system models that some of you may be familiar with, as well as um, numerical forecasting um, prediction systems as well. Um, but because what was available in WARF wasn't really keeping pace, 
this was what incentivized or motivated uh, the folks out at NASA to develop the land information system. And that's because through LIS, you can couple in far more sophisticated land service schemes than what you can get in the standard version of WAR. Now, you may ask, well, why don't they put things directly into WAR? Um, that's not a question that I can um, answer for you. I, I certainly have my own speculation um, behind that. And um, I guess um, maybe we'll, we'll see with time that we do have more um, sophisticated or up-to-date versions of land surface models directly embedded within, within WAR. Um, but until such time, then we've still got a model uh, uh, such as the wharf list environment that enables us to, to um, not wait and, and get on with it. Another thing to really focus on is about resolution. So um, as I said, this, this um, uses wharf. It's a regional um, atmospheric model. Um, when I started my PhD, uh, when we ran these models, you know, we'd, we'd probably be running them more often than not at 50 kilometre resolution. But now that we have Earth system models striving for this resolution, then it is um, incredibly important that our regional models are, are then striving for finer scale resolutions um, and reaching those convection permitting scales. This little graphic here is just giving you a snapshot um, of the Cortex Australasia domain, and it's just showing you the surface cover. So blue is water, and the different green hues correspond to different vegetation types. So even though we do have some differences in the vegetation cover at this resolution, it's, it's not um, a lot of variability there. But as soon as you start going to high resolutions, and this is at um, 800 meter resolution, then we start to see a lot more detail in the landscape. So we've got a lot more um, vari spatial variation in the vegetation, but you also have this for urban environments as well. So we have these different gray hues corresponding to the footprint of Sydney in this case, that we actually start differentiating that detail. So as we move towards higher resolution, it becomes imperative that we actually think a lot more about how we're modeling land surface processes because they provide the fluxes that define the bottom boundary condition for your atmospheric model. And that's really important in terms of how your boundary layer in the atmosphere develops and what that means for local weather phenomena. So here's the first bit of shameless self-promotion of Annette's research, hooray. Um, as I sort of already noted, there are different run modes with wharfless cable. You can run it offline with just the land surface model first, or you can run it um, coupled. Um, you cannot do that with the standard version of wharf. You can only run the, the system as an entirely coupled system. Why does that matter? Well, normally when you are running um, uh, a model such as WARF, you need to define what's happening at the boundaries of your domain in terms of um, large scale um, atmospheric conditions, but you also provide um, boundary conditions in terms of surface conditions and initial conditions as well. For ocean bodies, then this is just sea surface temperatures. Um, for the land surface, you usually are initializing um, state variables that include, say, the soil moisture and the soil temperature. Now, in the typical uh, standard version of WARF, you would just grab all this data from your favorite reanalysis product, plug it in, start running your model, and you'd probably discard a certain amount of time at the beginning of the simulation as spin up. Now, spin up varies between different modeling systems. For the atmospheric models, these tend to spin up a lot faster than land surface models, and land surface models spin up faster than ocean models. I guess, particularly if you're thinking about um, soil hydrology, if you're talking about carbon cycles, it's, it's another story as well. But what this means though, is that if you just take soil moisture data from a reanalysis uh, product and you plug this into your land surface model, it's gonna take some time to equilibrate. And generally uh, from our own um, experience in using this model system, that takes about five model years to run which um, in a coupled environment can take a while and may, mo may not be um, uh, the most efficient way to, to um, work. But with wharfless cable, we can run our land surface model offline first, and it is far more efficient and faster. And so in this study, which is the first paper out of my PhD, and I'm very proud of that, we actually assessed 
what impact that land surface initialization had on your skill. So if you just use standard reanalysis data um, at the initialization of your coupled simulations, you will find that you have poorer skill than if you had run your land surface model offline first and um, uh, equilibrated um, that soil moisture within your land surface um, model. Uh, in general, in terms of what we would like to advise users is that um, at least do five years of offline spin up uh, with LISC, the LISC cable environment first. Um, if you're interested in um, including groundwater processes, longer is better. And when I'm talking about longer, I'm talking about, you know, um, of the order of 30 years or so. And you might think 30 years, wow, um, 30 years is really quick to run, less than a day. Um, it, that, that can vary, of course, depending upon um, the size of your domain uh, and how many points uh, you've actually um, got. So a lot of things about why you might want to consider using this model, uh, and I will just recap that for you shortly, is that this enables us to use more sophisticated land surface models that include uh, a carbon cycle as well um, than what you can get in the standard version of WARF. It has a very um, efficient spin up of the land surface states because you can run the land surface model offline um, so that when you are initializing your coupled forecasts or simulations, you are doing this um, by using more realistic land surface initialization. You cannot do that with the standard version of WARF. Something that I haven't really gone into detail yet, but I do have some examples later on, is that it's a lot easier to manipulate the land atmosphere coupling in um, this model system because the land surface model is separate from the atmospheric model. And so it's a lot easier to get to those routines um, in order to manipulate the coupling if that's something that you're interested in doing. Finally, although LIS, we're using this predominantly as a uh, coupler to couple cable into WARF, there's a whole lot of added utility with this system that we have yet to explore. This includes the ability to do parameter optimization, which is advantageous for um, calibration of land surface uh, parameters. There's data assimilation. A lot of people are already doing that um, with brace data, for example, um, and many other things. And um, really those tools, they're, they're sort of there at the periphery. And it's more a matter of if people feel that they need that additional utility, um, uh, that, that they should get in touch and have a chat with us. So uh, hopefully now I've convinced all of you that this is a model you might want to start using in your own research. And so the next logical thing is where do I get the code from and give it to me now? So it is worth pointing out that there are three different systems that we're talking about. WARF um, is generally open source, but we're using NASA's uh, unified version of WARF. Um, Cable is a community-based model. You do need to sign a license agreement in order to access cable code. Um, but LIS, um, and I guess this is also paired with, with New Wharf, is um, developed by NASA and it is under license. So CLEX has an agreement, um, a long-standing agreement um, with NASA to use the LIS system. And therefore, as a consequence, we can't just hand out the code to anyone. Um, uh, there, there are some rules in place about um, being affiliated with Plex in, in order to access those codes. If you're, you're, you want the codes or you you're want to know whether you are eligible to access them, my advice would be that you should reach out to the CMS team and send us an email um, to our, our help desk and we can then start the conversation from there. And uh, we don't just give you model code. We have invested a great deal of effort to create a suite of tools that enable you um, ease of use in terms of setting up the model, um, setting up your configurations and just get on with the job and start doing your science. So we have two main Bitbucket repositories. Um, one of them contains Python codes. These are codes that help sort of set up all the necessary steps for actually running this system. And then we have a number of template scripts, um, which uh, basically consist of different branches on this repository that um, have different configurations that we've tested. And I'm not sure how um, easy this is for you to see, but you will see that we have a list of different branches here. And these um, all cover the Cortex Australasian domain that I've showed in a figure earlier. Um, but at different resolutions. Um, 
And we also have an example with nesting. So this helps you in terms of understanding some of the necessary uh, things that you need to set in the different configuration files, um, as well as we've already done a whole lot of testing to determine the optimal resource requests for these resolutions. So hopefully that can sort of guide you as a starting point of, of running this model and um, the things to be mindful of. So uh, what's the actual workflow for running this model? There are a number of different steps involved. Um, for those who are familiar with WARF, um, some of them um, really, there's, there's tools that leverage off the existing suite of tools that are available with WARF, but with some additional steps um, that are required. So the first thing is that you um, use one of the WARF preprocessing tools called GeoGrid. And you use this to set up your domain in terms of where it is, what resolution. And once you have that domain set up, um, then that information about the grid and the domain is actually used to populate all the grid information and all the configuration files, both for WARF, for list, and for cable. So the next step is that we need to prepare all the necessary inputs for the land surface scheme cable and um, NASA has developed a tool that does this um, in a manner that's fairly seamless. And it's called LDT, the land data tool. It's a pre-processing system that will then interpolate all the parameter data sets that your land surface model requires onto the grid that you're running. What I find really nice about this is that it provides you with some provenance information about how those inputs were created and where they were sourced from. And it's really important, I think, in this day and age with being transparent about how we are creating our simulations, um, that we have um, good record of how we actually create all the necessary inputs. And this is very fast step to run uh, of the matter of, uh, on the scale of minutes. The next step is to run list cable um, offline. Um, and here, um, uh, yeah, as I've said earlier, the recommendation is at least five model years and the templates are set up to do the five years. If you're interested in including um, groundwater, I would really encourage you to increase that timeline. And from a computational point of view, this is really cheap to run. Um, and uh, it's up to you as to how frequently you want to save those outputs um, to check um, how well the spin up is doing. Alternatively, if you are a land surface modeler and you just want to just work in, in the cable world itself, um, have at it um, and, and you can stop there. Um, but really the utility of this whole system is that you can transition seamlessly to the coupled environment. So let's keep going. Once you've run your spin up, you then need to run LDT again. And the reason for this is that it takes the final outputs from your um, offline simulation um, to create the initial condition files that WARF is going to require in order for the coupled system to run. Again, this is a very um, fast uh, step to implement. Next, uh, then we start, uh, we, well, we need to create the boundary condition files and initial condition files that WARF requires to run. And here we leverage off the existing tools that are already provided by the WARF um, pre-processing uh, system. And again, this is a fairly um, straightforward step that many WARF users would be quite familiar with doing. And once you've done that, then you can uh, continue through to running your coupled simulations. And, um, and hopefully, um, you know, you have every success in doing that. Now, I know that that's a lot of information to take in. Um, but uh, I've invested a great deal of time over the last month in creating some documentation for this model system so that users, um, you, you've got um, a really good uh, source of information about what you need to do, um, all the steps along the way. You don't have to memorize what I've just told you. Um, we've got some documentation um, on our Bitbucket repositories um, that we are regularly maintaining and keeping up to date. Um, and as part of that, um, we, we've started creating a page about some good practice when you're running this model um, and some known issues. This is a page on the wiki that we are regularly um, updating um, as issues emerge. 
I really want to emphasize that um, we have spent a lot of time creating these templates. So um, it, it's really advised that when you are first running um, this model that you start with those test cases and you see that you, you can um, you can get it running successfully and, and you can check that your outputs are sensible um, before you start making some modifications. And I would really urge you that if you are unsure, um, you should definitely be reaching out to us um, and, and asking those questions. And, and we're quite happy um, to get to those queries as quickly as possible. So what are some of the things that we've been doing with this model system? So, um, uh, we have done um, uh, a sensitivity analysis uh, varying some of the atmospheric physics that are available in WARF. For those who are familiar with WARF, you would be well aware that there are so many different parameterization um, options available in WARF. It is starting to get a little bit um, ridiculous. Um, but consequently, there's not necessarily a great deal of guidance for users on um, the optimal configuration of that model. So. Um, as a consequence of that, there's um, a proliferation in the peer reviewed literature of people doing sensitivity analyses uh, in order to make um, some assessment about um, how they should be configuring um, their WARF model or the atmospheric physics in particular for their intended application. And so we, we have also done that um, in WARF this cable primarily because we wanted to understand you know, whether there were um, any incompatibilities in some of the physics options available uh, in WARF. Now, it's not realistic to do every configuration, um, but we've picked some that are um, very common uh, parameterizations that people have utilized and some of the new ones as well. And what I can advise you is that some um, uh, configurations just do not run. In particular, if you're interested in running with the CAM radiation scheme, it won't work in this system at all. Um, and uh, what this graphic that I'm, I'm showing on the right here is, is some of the results out of um, that kind of uh, analyses um, where we have um, different regions uh, over Australia and different climate variables and then different um, physics configurations where we evaluate the skill in quite a comprehensive manner. And this has really enabled us to identify configurations that might be too hot, too cold, too wet. Um, and uh, uh, out of all of that, we have also then provided some recommended configurations where you have um, greater confidence in the skill of, of the system itself. And incidentally, one of the um, more robust or, or um, most skillful configurations is the configuration that is currently recommended for from well at uh, the wharf users web page as well so it's really nice to see some consistency there and i would really say that anyone new to using this model system um, it may be advantageous to check out this paper and and uh, learn a bit about some of the um, different configurations and, and help identify what may be more useful for your intended um, re research application. Uh, I did already allude to earlier that um, one of the really neat features of this system is, is that it's been such a valuable tool in order to evaluate land atmospheric coupling. And um, again, this is a shout out to one of my PhD papers where I actually provided the first assessment of land atmosphere coupling um, for Australia. Um, and this actually uses a specific type of experimental design where you have two sets of ensembles, one fully coupled and another where you um, prescribe the soil moisture states to effectively decouple the land surface model from variability um, coming from the atmospheric model. And by comparing the two, you can infer um, the strength of that coupling which is what's illustrated in these panels on the right here. And a really important thing that came out of this research is that that coupling is not a fixed quantity of the model. It really can vary um, by what atmospheric physics you choose to implement in the wharf side of things, as well as the uh, soil moisture state as well. And that soil moisture state varies depending upon what's happening with precipitation. And that is um, very sensitive to what's happening when it comes to um, the modes of intranual variability. So things such as 
um, El Nino Southern Oscillation and the Indian Ocean Dipole come to mind. So that coupling can vary quite a bit. And so depending upon what your hypothesis is, that's really going to be critical um, in order to understand how um, sensitive your atmosphere is to variability in the landscape. And um, this does require special um, simulations to do. And some of you may be quite happy to tinker around in model code, others um, perhaps less so. But there are other um, methods that don't require that um, from the land atmosphere um, coupling um, community that can enable um, similar uh, types of assessments to speed up that process. But continuing on that line, actually, um, uh, myself and Malcolm King uh, published a very nice study uh, last year where we actually took it to the next level. And instead of, um, I guess, uncoupling or decoupling the land surface model everywhere, we were really uh, selective about where we did that. And I think we implemented the first known um, application of partial decoupling for land atmosphere type research um, in the world, which is really neat. Um, and so we're selective about where and when we do that decoupling. And this is really advantageous if you want to interrogate the role of local land atmosphere interactions and distinguishing that from uh, remote land atmosphere interactions. And this kind of experimental setup um, really helps um, if you're interested in um, tackling those kinds of questions, or at least I, I think it is. And fortunately for you, um, I've also written a wiki page um, about how you actually implement that kind of experiment in terms of the necessary code modifications that need to be applied in this modeling system uh, and all the necessary steps in order to get that running. It is a little bit of an involved process. Um, uh, so, um, you know, depending on how confident you are in modifying Fortran code, uh, my, my instructions may be sufficient or they may not be. We do have a version of the model code where it was um, implemented if, if you need additional guidance uh, along those lines. Uh, finally, um, I want to say something about resolution. Uh, as I've already alluded to earlier in this talk, resolution is just so important um, with regional climate modelling, particularly as you strive for um, going to those convection permitting scales. And a very big ambition of, of um, my work and, and that of Claire as well has been to get wharf cable um, numerically stable at higher resolutions and success um, has been achieved. So we are now quite confident that we can run uh, this model um, for the Cortex Australasia domain. It's quite a large domain with a lot of water, but we can run this, um, we can um, uh, at 50 kilometers, which we've always been able to do, and that can be very useful for testing purposes, um, but it can easily be run now at 25 um, kilometers as well as 12 and a half kilometers. So it's at a scale now, I think, where it can, um, most certainly contribute to Cordex initiatives going forward into the future. Uh, we've also um, made sure that nesting capability is working. So this is where you might have um, one parent domain and then within that you will zoom in on a particular area of interest and have a nested domain where you're running it at a higher resolution. And this is now possible as well in Warfless Cable. Um, and you can do this in the offline environment with just the land surface model as well as transitioning to the coupled environment. This is a fairly um, seamless process. And you just really need to be mindful of um, what the um, storage requirements will be because suddenly you are increasing um, your outputs. I think I've already mentioned earlier, we've already done a lot of scaling tests to determine the optimal um, resource requirements to run this um, uh, at NCI. So um, some of that work has already been um, done for you. Um, and I guess that is all that I really wanted to cover today so we can finish a little earlier. Um, I know that um, this has been quite a high level talk, um, but I would really urge people that if you're interested in learning more about this model, the first port of call is to send your queries um, to the CMS um, help desk and we can sort of go from there in terms of um, uh, um, giving you access to the model code and all the um, repositories that we've created for the tools in order to 
set up and run the model and also for doing um, some very basic evaluations as well. And I think with that, I'll, I'll happily hit pause and, and take any questions um, that you may have. Um, I've got one. Yep. So yeah, first of all, thanks for writing all of this documentation. Um, <laughs> and just remembering when we started in 2012 with cable in list, it's been a while, a lot of work. So it's a um, yeah, long journey. But yeah, it's really great to see all of this so nicely documented. It's uh, really fantastic. My question is, uh, since we run work with ERA 5, is it possible to run lists of line with ERA 5 as well for consistency or is it something we need to develop? Yep, a uh, great question. So at the moment, what I've been doing has been using ERA interim and yeah. I can run ERA interim for the offline uh, metrological forcing for cable. And then when I transition to the coupled environment, I'm also using ERA interim as boundary conditions. Um, we do already have in the CMS team tools for using, oh, I guess, getting ERA 5 into the format for WAR. And so um, from the coupled side of things, yes. Uh, if you want to use then ERA 5 for the offline, we do need to add um, that as a new metrological forcing um, within WARFLIS cable. It's not, um, it's not impossible to do. And it's more a matter of, of um, there have been other priorities this year, so we haven't gotten there yet. Cool. Nice. Um, sorry if I missed this earlier, but do you know what version of Wharf, New Wharf, this New Wharf is based on? <laughs> oh, I think it's 3.9. It's 3.9.1.1. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> okay. Are we aware of plans to transition to four? So um, I know that the NASA team has a newer version of New Wolf, but because we were getting the coupling with cable working, we didn't upgrade. Um, I don't know when we will upgrade. Uh, that's an open question still. Depends on priorities. It's it's probably worth me saying that Jason and Jatin, if those are important to you, you should send uh, a request to the address on the screen so we don't forget. Um, whether it can be done or not is different, but it would be good to flag it. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, Andy. I wanted to say, um, yes, for the moment, although we, we try to, to test a few things, uh, there are so many features and options and for things and everything that can be tested. Um, if you are interested in this system and you would like to run it in a specific way, please let us know because it will help us prioritize what we do and um, how we develop things after. So yeah, I'm, I'm keen to run some simulations around uh, um, um, crop parameters, which should not really require modifications to the code, but I'd like to, um, I think it might make a lot of sense if we, um, if we can come up with some common control simulations that many people can use um, so to avoid um, different, uh, yeah, it, it's, um, so I'm, I'm happy to chat with anyone who's planning to run soon. Um, probably I'll, I'll have, I'll uh, probably should catch up with you, Andy. Uh, not entirely sure I'd be very useful, Jetton, but feel free to catch up with me anytime you want. <laughs> sure. um, the idea of doing a what we might describe as a standard control experiment run for a significant period of time is always attractive because it forms a foundation for other work. Um, so I don't I don't think there's a huge problem with that. 
the yeah. question comes what configuration is run and um yeah people like annette and claire would be much better at advising what that would be than me because i was yeah. wondering something along the same lines that you know like right now we have a oeh running in our team two um and kind of like would be interesting to know how that compares to a um like a run with cable yeah so those narcling 2 is um complying with the codex simip 6 protocol and i'd be very interested in getting a wolf cable runs into that um those simulations if possible i, I think if uh, now probably is the right time to push it if we want it to happen and collaborate with them so they started to run all sort of uh, I don't know, test or things, I'm not sure. Yeah, they're well, doing the Aero 5 um, driven runs uh, being uh, underway at the moment. Hmm. Um, and that would be the first step we'd like to do here, which matches with what Jatin was asking about in terms of a control, a long control simulation. I guess in that instance, Jason, I mean, would you be interested in simulations where we're using the same physics as the ones that you're running already with the standard version of WARF or? No, not necessarily. I think I'd be looking at the work we did previously and testing some of the best configurations that we identified there to make sure they work at this higher resolution, still work well, and then choose, choose a configuration that works well, basically. Mm -hmm rather than trying to match something else. Does that require zero five? Yeah, that's, uh, that requires zero five. Yep. So um, I have no idea how hard it is to get this running with zero five. Um, again, I, I would send that email, Jason, to the CWS help. And it sounds like a very sensible thing to do. Um, if it's relatively straightforward, it becomes a very high priority. If it's two years work, it becomes a very low priority. I shouldn't think it would be that hard, but, um, uh, it, yeah, so with Annette leaving, it's a bit more problematic. So for information, Annette was there, but, um, when Annette was there, it took me a month to get, uh, Irene to him as a forcing for the model. Um, so... Okay. And and Iran to him is a bit problematic in a sense because some of the forcing is um, accumulation. Um, it's it's not in forecast. It's it's, it's a forecast um, data and not free analysis. I think for Iran five it's different. So yeah. I think at the very least, Claire, doing a little due diligence on the Iran five data to judge the scale of the effort. I, I suspect would be worth you doing. Mm -hmm. Did you um, try these kind of like configurations for or consider them uh, for a um, daily forecasting? Oh, I haven't done that yet, no. I guess we're running in OEHJ or CMAC now uh, for daily forecasting. Uh, and kind of very tempting to <laughs> try this system for for these combinations. Yeah, hard, hard to say because I haven't done it. <laughs> I don't know how easy it is. Um, but I guess maybe if if there's a lot of similarities between you know Wolf and Wolf List, then then it should be possible. So I'll, I'll echo Jatin's comments earlier about the documentation. I really appreciate the effort put into the documentation. Um, just had a quick quick look to try and connect to it through the CMS wiki and couldn't find connection to any of that documentation from the CMS wiki. <laughs> so that's my next task, right? <laughs> and do that really quickly to point you in the right direction. <laughs> I guess I've already said um, because... Um, because it's under license, this model, we, we just need to be mindful about sticking stuff on the um, CMS wiki page. Um, and, and therefore, it's still okay to email us um, 
and we will email you all those different links and I'm happy to do that for you as well, Jason, if you want to be able to see it. That would be nice, thanks. Yeah, no worries. But yeah, we could we could add the link to the documentation. It's always we're being too cautious, we tend to forget sometimes <laughs> what we can put a link to on it. So yeah. And um yeah, I mean I think it would be fine with the crowd today, but I just want to say also it's under license. The license terms are very, very generic. Like I think anyone who works in any of the of the universities of the center or anyone who works at CSR or at the bureau can use it. So, you know, it's like very broad, <laughs> uh, but it's still uh, it means we can't make it completely public. So, um, yeah, most people here, everyone here would be, I think, able to use it without too much problem. So I think it would be very valuable if we did uh, like a codex style era five um, simulation, similar to what's already happening. Um, my question is, do we have um, the compute resources and storage resources, um, I guess under your project, Andy, to run that um, is, is a question. Um, I think codex to domain is, um, what's the, is 15 kilometers, right, Jason, for the whole of Australia? Uh, well, I would like to be at the high end of the range that they give, and I think that the high end was 12 kilometers, 12.5 12, yeah, kilometer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, it's, it's always the case. The resources are available if the project is highly prioritized. The question is how high a priority it is to run a Cordex run with this model configuration. And that is a different question, but mm. the resources can be made available if the case is, is very strong. I mean, I'm thinking about Narklim, like if, if uh, this has any chance to go into Narklim, now it's the time, which kind of make it urgent. Um, yeah, but uh, the, the problem is, David, that Annette's leaving, there's a finite scale of human resources. It needs to use era five and it's not ready to be used era five. And um, Narklim has no relationship with Clex. So what we do, we do on a best, best capability and, and all endeavor. But yeah, if it's urgent and we can't meet those deadlines, so lovely. Unless Claire can be cloned or a net retained. Either of those options works for me. So, but I think the ERA5 issue is only for running offline, right? Running coupled with ERA5 should, should be, should, that should not matter. Yes. Yeah, that's correct, right? So it's only, I think no, no, no one will put us in jail if we run the offline part with ERA and Trim and coupled with ERA5. Um, I don't think it's a huge, huge problem. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. No, possibly though, only because there's a big difference in the resolution between those. So if you're in terms of 0.75 mm. and ERA5 is at 0.25. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, you, that might be, I mean, you, you can run the 12 kilometer with ERA interim, but yeah, I think you're, you're being, you know, a bit ambitious maybe then. Like in terms of the ratios between the forcing data and what you're running the model at. It, it does run because I've obviously done that in this testing, but um, just to be mindful of that. Well, the alternate is what, what's being done in other systems where you don't have that offline spin-up capability, which is just the, we just run a coupled model and the first year we just treat a spin-up and then we use the years yeah. after that right and that's what the other runs are doing hmm. and we could just replicate that or we think that it, we actually do get a benefit if we do a spin up even if it's with error interim hmm. compared to just doing the coupled um, run for one year spin up hmm. For, for, the, for the model to run, you do need um, 
you do need a bit of a spin up offline because you need a restart file for uh, to get the input yeah. as initial conditions. So you may as well just run a real spin up than just a fake one month spin up. Uh, <laughs> it will it will not be much more costly. Um, so yeah, I think I think Annette's comment was more about when forcing wolf with era five, if your wolf domain is at 12 kilometers and era five is at, I forgot how much, uh, 0.25, um, whether that's a right forcing for your body. That, that's okay. Using era five is okay, I think. Mm. But using era interim, it, um, oh, yes. it's a stretch. You know, it, I mean, you can, you can do it. Um, but I think if there's era five, it would be a preference to be using. I think. It sounds like we've come to time. Did, did anyone have any last questions or um, you all want me to spam you with documentation? <laughs> I, I sent you an email, Annette. I don't think there's any problem putting the documentation on the wiki. Okay, cool. Um, I, uh, I, I think there's a problem making lists freely available on the wiki, um, but the documentation, what? Unless there's some clever way via the documentation that someone can get hold of lists, I don't see there's any risk. So Andy, I just had a look at the NASA website and the list code is actually completely open source. It's the new wolf, which I believe is requires a, an actual um, right. proper licensing. Yeah. Whatever. I, I, I just think the documentation is no risk making it open no no it just it just it was just another site but <laughs> yeah yeah it's all right it's best to be conservative right um it's yeah. much better than me discovering you've made everything open source and it wasn't supposed to be that that's much worse <laughs> all right so the most important thing here is anybody who has demands on this to drop uh, email to that email address specifying that request so Claire can prioritize. Um, we do have new postdocs coming and some of these tasks could be uh, a nice spin up task for the new postdocs, perhaps, depending on the postdoc. So just think, just bear that in mind in terms of running the model, not the model development side, of course. Thank you, Annette. Thank you. Yeah, still Thanks time to reconsider. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, everyone else, for coming. Um, next week, I will continue with my Fortran tutorial. And um, that's it. Okay. Yeah, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, bye. Bye.